Welcome, dear friends, to the Crimson Academy's course on the Call of the Divine Beloved, Selected Mystical Works of Baha'u'llah. In this section, dear friends, we'll be covering the Seven Valleys. One of the writings of Baha'u'llah, which was revealed after his return from Suleymaniye, is the Seven Valleys. This work stands out as a masterpiece of mystical composition. It was written in response to the questions of Sheikh Muhyiddin, the judge of the town of Khanekhain, who was a Sufi. Although not a Babi, he was an admirer of Baha'u'llah and had written a letter to him expressing certain thoughts and posing some questions in mystical terms. The theme of the Seven Valleys is the journey of the soul from its abode in this world to the realms of nearness to God. The seven stages in the journey were already familiar to the Sufis, having been described by Farad, Farad din, din Attar, an outstanding exponent of Sufism in its early stages. His Holiness Baha'u'llah elucidates the profound meaning and significance of these seven stages. First comes the Valley of Search, wherein is described the path which a true seeker must take to attain his object, which is the recognition of the manifestation of God for the age in which he lives. Before everything else, he must cleanse the heart, which is the wellspring of divine treasures from every marking, must turn away from following the traces of forefathers and sires, and must shut the door of friendliness and enmity upon all the people of the earth. He must sacrifice whatever he have seen and heard and understood. Ardor, zeal, and patience are the necessary qualities for him on this plane. Next is the Valley of Love. Here the wayfarer is like a moth, which has found a flame and longing to reach it circles around, coming closer and closer until finally it is burnt in a blaze of sacrifice. This is a stage in which the heart of man is touched by the glory of the manifestation of God, whom he has sought and found. Here the believer understands neither reasons nor proofs. His heart is attracted, for he has fallen in love with his beloved. Indeed, the story of every religion is written in the language of love. In the early days of the faith of His Holiness Baha'u'llah, for instance, of the thousands who came in contact with the manifestation of God, and were attracted to him, some knowing little of the history, teachings, proofs, or laws of his cause, adored the Bab and Baha'u'llah. They were so intoxicated with the wine of their utterances that when occasion demanded it, they willingly gave their lives. So intense was their love that some believers who attained Baha'u'llah's presence begged him to accept them as martyrs. Others were so magnetized by his supreme power that they could not bear the thought of separation from him. For example, dear friends, when the news of Baha'u'llah's approaching departure for Constantinople reached his companions in Baghdad, they were plunged, one and all, into sorrow and consternation, 
On the first night, none of them would eat or sleep, and many decided to take their own lives, if deprived of accompanying him on his journey. Without a shadow of doubt, these companions, who were the lovers of his beauty, would have carried out their intention had it not been for the words of counsel and exhortation which Baha'u'llah addressed to them, words which consoled them and enabled them to resign themselves to the will of God. No greater story can be found to demonstrate this consuming love for Baha'u'llah than that of Haji Muhammad Jafar Tabrizi. He was a devoted believer who first attained the presence of Baha'u'llah in Baghdad, recognized his station, and devoted his life to the service of his Lord. When Baha'u'llah established his residence in Adrianople, Haji Jafar traveled with his brother, who was also a believer to that city, and resided there. He was so magnetized by Baha'u'llah that when he discovered that the authorities had not included his name among those who were to accompany Baha'u'llah to Akka, he attempted to cut his own throat. Some friends arrived just in time to save him. As a result of this, the authorities who were at first adamant in not allowing any of Baha'u'llah's followers to accompany him to Akka, changed their minds and permitted most of his companions to travel with him. Haji Jafar's condition, however, was serious. His throat was bleeding profusely, and he was taken to hospital for treatment. The authorities promised him that when his wounds healed, he would be allowed to proceed to Akka with his brother. Two months later, they both arrived there and joined Baha'u'llah in the most great prison. The third stage of the journey is the Valley of Knowledge. The word knowledge, however, can be misleading as it does not convey the full meaning of the original word marafet, used by Baha'u'llah. It is difficult to find a single word in English which can faithfully impart its full significance, a combination of true understanding, recognition, and knowledge. The knowledge referred to in this valley is not primarily based on learning. The knowledge of God dawns upon man through his heart. Pride in one's learning and accomplishments often deprives the heart of the light of true understanding. The soul in this valley recognizes the truth and reaches the stage of certitude, his inner eyes will open, and he will privily converse with his beloved. He acquires a new vision and begins to understand the mysteries of God's revelation and creation. He will not be despondent when faced with pain and calamities, rather he will approach them with understanding and resignation, for he will see the end in the beginning and will discover that suffering and tribulations are eventually realized to be God's mercy and blessing. In everything he finds a wisdom. He, in this station, is content with the decree of God and seeth war as peace and findeth in death the secrets of everlasting life. In the ocean he findeth a drop, in a drop he beholdeth the secrets of the sea.
The next stage is the Valley of Unity, where the wayfarer is uplifted from the plane of limitation into that of the absolute. Here he no longer sees the world of creation subjectively, restricted by the limitations of his own eyes, but sees it objectively through the eyes of God. He discovers that each created thing manifests according to its capacity, some of the attributes of God, and that the degree of such manifestation differs in each kingdom of creation. Like a man who soars into outer space and looks down upon the earth with an all-encompassing vision, the wayfarer freed from the cage of self and passion and released from the bondage of limitation enters upon the plane of universality. His vision has widened to such an extent that no longer is he concerned with his own self or attached to this world. He sees in everything the signs and tokens of God. He looketh on all things of the eye of oneness and seeth the brilliant rays of the divine sun shining alike on all created things and the lights of singleness reflected over all creation. In this valley, there is no place for ego. Here the soul steppeth into the sanctuary of the friend and shareth as an intimate the pavilion of the loved one. He seeth in himself neither name nor fame nor rank, but findeth his own praise in praising God. Having attained to this lofty station of detachment from the world, the wayfarer becomes independent of all created things and enters the valley of contentment. Although outwardly he may be poor, inwardly he is endowed with wealth and power from the world of spirit. The history of the faith has recorded many moving episodes in the lives of early believers who held high positions and enjoyed riches and luxuries. On embracing the faith, however, they were stripped of their rank and earthly possessions by the enemies of the cause. Yet many of them who had not focused their attention on the things of the world and had ascended to the plane of contentment remained unaffected by poverty and destitution, persecution and suffering. The changes and chances of this world were powerless to weaken their faith or disturb their serenity and peace of mind. Happiness is one of the attributes of the true believer, but this cannot be achieved by a life founded on the delights and pleasures of this world. For such happiness is only transitory and can indeed be sorrow in disguise. Only those who have entered the valley of contentment have experienced true joy. Even though their lives be subjected to affliction and suffering. His Holiness Baha'u'llah states that the wayfarer in the valley of contentment burns away the veils of want. From sorrow he turneth to bliss, from anguish to joy. His grief and mourning yield to delight and rapture. The life of His Holiness Abdul Baha, the exemplar of the teachings of His Holiness Baha'u'llah, stands out as a shining example 
of what real happiness is. From the age of nine, he shared the sufferings and persecutions inflicted upon his father, spending 40 years in Akka as a prisoner of two Turkish despots. Yet during those dark years, he remained the most cheerful of the companions of His Holiness Baha'u'llah and poured out his love on all whom he met. A few years after his release, he said, Freedom is not a matter of place, but of condition. I was happy in that prison, for those days were passed in the path of service. To me, prison was freedom. Troubles are a rest to me. Death is life. To be despised is honor. Therefore was I full of happiness all through that prison time. When one is released from the prison of self, that is indeed freedom. For self is the greatest prison. When this release takes place, one can never be imprisoned unless one accepts dire vicissitudes, not with dull resignation, but with radiant acquiescence. One cannot attain this freedom. Having attained contentment, the traveler comes to the valley of wonderment and is struck dumb with the beauty of the all-glorious. Like a person who, diving into the ocean, suddenly becomes conscious of its enormous size and fathomless depth, the wayfarer in this valley beholds the vastness of creation and its infinite range. With unclouded vision and clear insight, he now discovers the inner mysteries of God's revelation and is led from one mystery to a thousand more. At every moment he beholdeth a wondrous world, a new creation, and goeth from astonishment to astonishment, and is lost in awe at the works of the Lord of Oneness. Dear friends, the last valley towards which the wayfarer can strive is the valley of true poverty and absolute nothingness the furthermost state of mystic knowers and the furthest homeland of the lovers. This station, Baha'u'llah affirms, is the dying from self and the living in God, the being poor in self and rich in the desired one. Poverty, as here referred to, signifies being poor in the things of the created world, rich in the things of God's world. For when the true lover and devoted friend reacheth to the presence of the beloved, the sparkling beauty of the loved one and the fire of the lover's heart will kindle a blaze and burn away all veils and wrappings. Yea, all he hath, from his heart to skin, will be set aflame, so that nothing will remain save the friend.